So substitution reactions, they appear all the time on the MCAT and for good reason. What they teach you about carbocation stability and steric hindrance can be applied to a lot of things in orgo. Some classic reactions, the Williamson ether synthesis, the Gabriel synthesis, are substitution reactions. So the MCAT really likes to test you on SN1, SN2, and how they compare and contrast. Okay, so we start with SN1. The first step is the dissociation of a leaving group, which forms a carbocation. Here I have bromine leaving, and this happens regularly, depending on some key factors, which I will get to in a bit, but remember, molecules are not static things, they are dynamic. Think of your conformations of cyclohexane, chair, boat, twist boat. Molecules are constantly moving and twisting, and in some instances, atoms can dissociate. So when that happens, if another nucleophile is present, it can come in and donate its electrons to the super strong electrophilic carbocation, resulting in a substitution. So SN1 happens in two steps. First the carbocation is formed, then the nucleophile substitutes in. Okay, well if it's two steps, how come it's called SN1? The one has to do with its kinetics. SN1 is a unimolecular reaction. It shows first order kinetics. That's where the one comes from. So that means that formation of the carbocation, the leaving group dissociation, is the rate determining step, and therefore the rate only depends on the concentration of the substrate. That said, there are some key factors that do affect the reaction, the first and most important of which is carbocation stability. The more stable the carbocation, the more likely the leaving group is to dissociate, and the more likely the SN1 reaction is to actually happen. So benzylic and allylic carbocations, and you can see the positions below the chart, are the most stable. They are able to stabilize the positive charge through resonance, and they will be the most readily to undergo SN1. Uh, but on the MCAT, you're less likely to encounter a question about substitution elimination reactions at these positions. What you are likely to encounter is a question at a tertiary carbon. Tertiary carbocations are very stable as well and readily undergo SN1. Secondary carbons are a little bit less stable, but they still can undergo SN1. But primary carbocations are just so unstable as to effectively prevent the reaction from occurring. Uh, if you see a substitution or question regarding a primary carbon, you can rule out SN1 as its mechanism. So that's why I put primary in red here. Okay, the nature of the leaving group can also affect the reaction. The better a leaving group is, the more likely it is to dissociate. So what makes a good leaving group is if it's stable as an anion, as a negatively charged species. So what does that mean? Think back to your acidity trends. The conjugate bases of strong acids are weak, which makes them very stable. So this means most often you see halogens as the leaving group. Fluorides are actually poor leaving groups, as you might imagine, as HF is not a strong acid. It doesn't fully dissociate. Another leaving group is something called a tosylate, which is used when you want to substitute out a hydroxyl group, as hydroxyl groups don't make good leaving groups. So you first convert them to a tosylate, and then they become good leaving groups. So if you were to compare the example I have versus the same molecule but with chlorine, the bromine will be more likely to undergo SN1. There are solvent effects to consider as well. Basically all you need to know is that SN1 favors polar protic solvents. Here are a few examples. You can see they're all polar and can donate a proton. And now these factors don't really affect the reaction, but there's some facts that you need to know about SN1. So the products of the reaction will be racemic. You can see this given the mechanism that the nucleophile has the option of adding to either side, and it does. So the configuration of the products can be R or S, and it'll be both. And when you have both, you have a race mate. The SN1 reaction also prefers strong nucleophiles. Now, I want to be clear, the rate does not depend on the nature or the concentration of the nucleophile, but rather, a stronger nucleophile will favor the forward reaction over the reverse. You can see the two-way arrows in the mechanism. Well, if the substitute is a weaker nucleophile than the original leaving group, then the reverse reaction is favored. If it's stronger, then the forward reaction is. So here are some examples of strong nucleophiles. Uh, if you're shaky on what makes something a strong nucleophile, just Google it. There are lots of good results to look at. 
And finally, one thing to always remember when you have carbo cations is the possibility for rearrangement. If they can rearrange to form a more stable carbocation, they will. The top example here is a 1,2 hydride shift. And 1,2 is all you're going to see on the MCAT. 1,3 can happen, but it's much less common. So a hydride ion, H-, shifts over to the secondary carbocation, which creates a tertiary carbocation on the carbon at left. If there is no hydrogen to perform this shift, an entire methyl group can do it. That's what's shown in the bottom one, the 1,2 methyl shift. So just watch out for that on the test. This isn't specific to substitution reactions, but rather carbocations in general. So that's SN1. Now we'll move on to SN2 and really start to compare and contrast the two. Okay, so SN2. The hallmark of this reaction is backside attack by the nucleophile. It comes in the back and forms this transition state. And don't confuse this with an intermediate. An intermediate is a tangible molecule, whereas the transition state is a theoretical construct to show something works. So there are two partial negative charges in the transition state. If the attacker is a stronger nucleophile than the leaving group, it kicks the leaving group, group off and completes the substitution. And all of this happens in one step. It's a concerted reaction. There's no carbocation formation like in SN1, and that's a key difference. So it's called SN2 because it's a bimolecular reaction. The rate is dependent on both the concentration of the substrate and the concentration of the nucleophile. And that makes sense if you think about this reaction. When the nucleophile gets close to the backside of the substrate, the reaction is going to happen. If you increase the concentration of either, there will be more opportunities for the reactants to be in proximity, to be in the right spot relative to each other. So just like SN1, there are factors affecting SN2, the biggest of which is steric hindrance. Now, steric hindrance is otherwise known as there's stuff in the way. If there's something in the way, the nucleophile can't come around the back to attack the carbon, so the reaction doesn't happen. Uh, if you've ever seen one of those hoarding TV shows, imagine trying to get into that person's house. You're going to have some difficulty because their doorways are sterically hindered. There's a bunch of stuff in the way. That's what it's like for the nucleophile in SN2. What this means is that SN2 pretty much only happens at primary and secondary carbons as tertiary, allylic, and benzylic positions just have too much stuff in the way. They're too sterically hindered. This leads to SN2 having the opposite trend of SN1 when it comes to reactivity with classes of carbons and is the number one thing you should look for when determining mechanism. Always start with determining the class of carbon when deciding between SN1 and SN2. If it's primary, it's SN2. If it's tertiary, it's SN1. The only real overlap is with secondary carbons. If you get a question on the MCAT that asks you to determine the mechanism or some variant of a question like that, and it's a secondary carbon, there are other, there are other things you can look for, which I'll get to in just a bit. Uh, but first, Leaving groups affect SN2 the same way they affect SN1. There's no difference there. There is a difference in solvent, though. SN2 favors polar aprotic solvents rather than protic ones. Why is really not important for the MCAT, just knowing that there is a difference? Here are some examples of polar aprotic solvents. Basically, just look for molecules with a dipole moment, but which have no protons to donate. There's also a distinction in the products. Whereas SN1 led to racemic products, SN2 will still be op optically active, as the backside attack leads to a relative inversion in the products, which you can see in the mechanism example. So what this means is that if you started with an R, you would get either an R or an S, but not both. And when you have only one enantiomer, the products will be op optically active. Whether the product remains the same enantiomer as the reactant is dependent on the priority of the nucleophile versus the priority of the leaving group. In other words, if the reactant were R, the product would be S if the nucleophile and leaving group share the same priority, and if they didn't share that, the product can actually remain R. And finally, SN2 favors strong, non-bulky nucleophiles. They have to be non-bulky so they can actually attack from the backside. If the nucleophile itself has too much stuff in the way, if it's too sterically hindered, it can attack effectively. To go back to my entering a doorway example, if you're trying to move a couch into the house, you're going to have some difficulty. 
And in S and two terms, this prevents the reaction from really happening. Steric hindrance applies to all molecules, not just the substrate. And one last note, which I don't have on the chart, uh, you don't need to worry about rearrangement with SN2 as there's no carbocation formation. So that's it. And yeah, really know this stuff. If the MCAT people decide to be jerks and give you a question about a secondary carbon, rely on your knowledge of solvent and nucleophiles to make the determination. More often than not, they ask what the major product will be, and that's what matters. At secondary carbons, you will get both mechanisms. Make no mistake, both SN1 and SN2 do happen at secondary carbons. But the th things you can do with solvents and nucleophiles can guide the reaction to prefer one mechanism over the other, and that's really what the MCAT people are going to test you on. So here are a few questions. Pause the video while you're working them, as the answer slide will appear in about five seconds, so pause it now. And here are the answers. As usual, if you have any questions about the problems or anything in this video, feel free to leave a comment, and also pause the video again here if you'd like more time to review the answers. Okay, so definitely know the ins and outs of SN1 and SN2, and how they compare and contrast, because like I said, they appear all the time on the MCAT. You'll see them a lot more in your studying, so get the basics down now, as things get a little bit more complicated when elimination reactions are added to the mix which will be my next video.